Good morning and welcome to From Me to You on Hippie Radio. This is Richard Courtney, humbly sitting with the great Mark Lewis. And Mark Lewis, and for those of you who have not heard of him, he has written the greatest books on the Beatles of all time. He has graced us with his presence in the studio today. He is a god in the Beatle historian world, and we're thrilled to have him this week, and we will run excerpts from our interview for weeks and weeks to come because this is a dream come true for me. I cannot be more happy to have anyone here. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. And Mark has written two books. The first one I know about is The Complete Beatles Recording Session. Is that your first? No. No, that, oh. was, no, I, that was not my first book on the Beatles. That was oh, which my one? second, maybe, maybe even my third. Oh, which was your first? It was called The Beatles Live. It came out in 86, and that was a guide to every live engagement the Beatles had done from the Quarrymen Skiffle Group through to Candlestick Park in 66. And that's what's amazing about you is that you do start with the Quarrymen, and you go, I guess, until today, eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm not that interested in today. But yesterday, yes. Yesterday was a good one. <laughs> yeah, you, you have to start at the beginning. And I actually got into all this research because one of the first research tasks I ever had was to establish definitively the date that Lennon met McCartney. We know the story that John was playing with his band, the Quarrymen, at a church fete in Walsham, an area of Liverpool. But when was it? So having established the date of that for the first time, which was uh, July 6, 57. I was so intrigued by how one could discover information and that the books that we had at that time, there weren't that many, but it seemed that there were quite a few, that they were all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, well, I could just keep going here and see what else I can find. And that eventually led to The Beatles Live, and that led to the Recording Sessions book. And what's interesting about uh, what you just said is that many of the stories that we've heard through the years on the Beatles are wrong. In particular, it's funny to read your book, the Recording Sessions book, and it's filled with everything. And when reading it back in the 80s, I read this, but it didn't register much that the Beatles had come to EMI in June and they recorded Love Me Do with Pete Best. Mm. And then as the myth goes, George Martin said he wasn't good enough, called Epstein. The Beatles wanted to get rid of him anyway, so they fired him. And then the way the story goes is... George had already hired Andy White for the September 4th sessions, and then they showed up with Ringo, and they let White do one, and they let Ringo do one. But really, they showed up with Ringo, and he wasn't good enough either, so then they got White, right? Correct. And it's in your book the whole time, but yet even on the anthology, George Martin tells the story wrong. They all did. Yes. George Martin did tell the story of the Beatles in 62 wrong in a number of ways, and continued to do so because those stories were wedded in his head to you know events as he remembered them. But documentation is really where you need to go. And the essence of my research over the years has been to find pieces of paper and not to rely on memory. But ideally, to put the two together so that you've got the anecdote on top of a solid piece of information. But along the way, you do end up disproving certain things. And growing up in the 60s and 70s, the inference was always that how do you do it was going to be their second record. Right. But in fact, the plan all along was that it would be their first record. The thing about Andy White turns out he was there at the session after Ringo because George Martin didn't think that Ringo was particularly good. Ringo was and is a brilliant drummer, but that was his first time in a recording studio and he was trying to overcompensate. He was trying to do everything at once mm -hmm. and they, they thought he was mad. Are you a musician, by the way? No, I'm not. And this is interesting because having never met you, is you were relying more on documentation and records. I know you have an, an interview with Paul McCartney mm. that's in the recording session. So how'd you get to know the Beatles? The first book I wrote, The Beatles Live, came out in May 86. And Ringo and Paul, actually George liked it as well. I remember George signed a copy of it to me, as did Paul. But Paul went on the record, literally on radio, straight away and said it was the best Beatle book he had seen or read. Okay. Because at that time, they were Paul was particularly annoyed with the kind of the tone of Beatle books that came out in the aftermath of John Lennon's murder. Because in the promotion of John Lennon, that was inevitable following his murder, Paul was done down 
and he was getting fed up with the books. Right. And then my book came along, which didn't render any opinions. It simply was like a diary of their youth because it had where they were every night when they were growing up. Uh, you know, because <laughs> Paul playing with the quarrymen from when he was 15. Right. And here, well, they were, once they really hit their stride, the Beatles, they were playing most nights in different places. And when you're a musician, these places become a blur. That's right. And here it was all set down where they had been in the order of things. And he really liked it because it was just that and nothing more. And so he was keen to say how much he liked it. And I think he must have told Ringo about it. And one or two of the stories in the book became part of what they would say in interviews. The best one was my research that after a particular show I think they did in Preston in September 63, Paul drove 25 miles to judge a beauty contest <laughs> at the Imperial Ballroom in Nelson in Lancashire in the north of England, like a mill town. And then for a while after that, for the next few years, Paul and Ringo would mention that in interviews, <laughs> you know, of how hard they'd worked that Paul drove to judge a beauty contest. Yeah. And Paul told me that he was really just hoping to pull a bird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so I, that was nice and that got me into their orbit and Paul at that time 87 I interviewed him for the recording sessions book because he liked my work and then he offered me the opportunity to help him write his autobiography Oh, and I went under contract for the first time with Paul well, with his company NPL but in the end that project never actually came to fruition but uh, so he still hasn't to this day written his memoir are you considering it or is he considering i don't know whether he is he may still he has a landmark birthday coming up in june 22 when he will turn 80 but when i hear the interviews that they give these days they speak of those days in generalizations now right. they've kind of lost the specific detail they know that they can find it in a in any number of books but in their own head i think the memories are getting a bit fuzzy now and the optimum time for him to have written his memoir has passed, but that doesn't mean he won't have a go at it. But I have no knowledge of whether he will or not. Tune in, is that the uh, subtitle? Tune in is the book, title. The, the book the, title. the overarching title for the series is The Beatles All These Years, and then each of the three volumes will have its own title. Tune in is the first. Okay, and so the first, the special edition, is about 1,600 pages. 1,728. <laughs> uh, Give or take. I having penned a book or two myself, I always enjoy when it first comes back from the publisher and mm. get to see that must have been something to see to see yeah. your book that big. Absolutely. I'm the kind of author who stays engaged with the process all the way along the line and the publishers I work with have to accept that these books are not tossed off, you know. I mean that book is ten years work and therefore I don't really want to surrender sight of it at any time. So I go all the way I go to the printers, literally to the printers oh, to see so. it on press. Uh -huh. uh, so it's not that much of a surprise when I first take receipt of it. However, there is always that frisson moment of actually holding it in your hand for the first time. I did that. And especially with that book. The funny thing about your book is, for some of the listeners who may not have read it, I bought bought it when it first was released, but I bought what I didn't know. It's kind of like the Beatles records. Uh, I got the U.S. version, which was 200 pages shorter. And then when I was in Liverpool shortly thereafter, I saw another one, and I said, that looks a little bit larger than yes. mine. And the British, or at least the one I got in, in England, was 200 pages longer than the U.S. Yeah, I'm not mad on there being so many variant versions around. The honest answer is that the U.S. and U.K. mainstream editions, though they look different and have different pagination, do have identical content. Oh, they do? They do, but the Crown, my American publisher, wanted to give it a different cover, and they laid out the book differently. And in the end, the pagination number changed. But yes. the content is certainly the same. There's no difference between the two. So that is one book. And then there is the extend, so-called extended edition, which is not really extended. It's simply the everything I wrote edition. Yeah. <laughs> because I abridged it for the mass market. But that is the unabridged version. That's really the best way of describing it. Yes. And the book is so well written that certainly it can be intimidating to think someone's going to invest in time to read that many pages but the fact is we know the end so you can pick it up anywhere and, and read two or three hundred pages and your writing is phenomenal thank you it comes from passion really i mean the whole project is passion from me to the beatles it's a long love letter in, in <laughs> essence because they've been absolutely key and formative to everything in my life 
So, yes, it started with the music, but knowledge of the Beatles and researching them and trying to establish everything I possibly can that's true about what they did is central to who I am. Yes. It's what I do. The things you did, for one thing, just to explain the currency <laughs> so that Americans can understand it. Yeah. That way, and what it meant to get what they got every week. After Epstein picked them up, they were doing relatively well. Oh, they were doing very well. I mean, Brian Epstein's first year, the book ends in December 62, and they're on the very brink of their enormous breakthrough. Enormous isn't the word. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, they're on the brink of that. And so the last year the book covers, 1962, is the first full year of his management. He picks them up at the end of 61. And he gets them wealth that is far beyond their expectation in their first year, even though they're not yet national stars, merely by artful working of their nightly engagements and other things that he gets for them. They are on a lot of money in Liverpool terms, in British terms, by the end of 62, though they're not yet famous. His first year of management of the Beatles, which I really look at in great detail in the book, is uh, was superb. Yes, and, and so they probably out-earned their parents. At... Easily. Paul, yeah. Paul's dad was on £10 a week. By 1962, he really his salary hadn't changed much. His wage hadn't changed much for decades, and Paul was bringing home something like sixty or seventy right. a week. So, I mean, alone amongst their age group, they had cars. Yeah. You know, I mean, no one, no kid in Liverpool, the age of it, 19, 20, male, had a car. If they did, it was it was some knockoff job, you know, some right. something full of rust. But they had really nice new cars. What's another myth you'd like to debunk in the early days? We'll, we'll oh, keep it chronological gosh. somewhere. It's so hard. I don't set out to debunk myths. I just set out to say, to tell the story. Right. Um, this is, doesn't answer your question, but my challenge really is, is ahead of me still with volume two because the number of things that people don't understand about the Beatles in the years when we do know them, the more visible years from 63 on. I'm not going to set out to undo them, but a lot of people are going to wonder why I haven't covered X, Y, and Z, right. Z, as I would say, in the book. And it'll simply be because they, they didn't happen, or they, they're not true. <laughs> um, and I don't really want to put in things that aren't true just to say that they're not true. They don't have a place really in the book. Maybe as an end note, I might be mentioning certain things like that. But with the advent of the internet the last 20 years, the multiplication of misunderstandings of the Beatles is really something that I wasn't expecting. Yeah. And uh, a lot of the things I hear people say and, and read, and I just think, you just don't get it. Yeah, so that's like, not that's not for, to imply that I do get it, but I, having researched it much more deeply, the, I think I do have a better sense of things. Well, if you watch enough interviews, they're asked the same question everywhere they go over and over, and the hair and the name and the everything, yeah. and they tired of it, and they were witty and quick anyway, and so they just answered it, and you know yes. whatever they wanted to say. Like you have a funny face, didn't happen, right? You thinking of when John did that in his, his own right, and when he was actually he did say that. Oh, he did because I've read that he didn't say. Yeah, that. Yeah, you've got a lucky face. I mean, one continually learns. So I think I possibly may have been somebody who said that he didn't say it. Oh, okay. <laughs> because um, there was a, an audio recording of the BBC had an audio recording of that, and John just appears to say thank you very much and mm -hmm. sits down again. This is at the literary luncheon being held in his honour, at which the centre point would be his after lunch speech mm -hmm. and he basically was up on his feet for about five seconds but then some film emerged of it and actually you can see that he does say you've got a lucky face oh, he's almost back in his seat by the time he says it i mean that is a most fantastic event because you know there was john up on stage on this dais at the luncheon you know and everybody the way it was organized the toastmaster said, on your feet, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. John Lennon, and everybody gets up to raise their glass to him. And by the time they're back in their seats, he sat down again and it's all over. <laughs> and they're wondering when he's going to start. And they don't realize he's already done it. <laughs> it's a complete rebellion of you know what was expected of him. But I love to find pieces of paper, and I found an archive of papers which included some handwritten notes, file notes, as people used to call them, of John Lennon phoning his book publisher from the stage telephone at the Scala Theatre in the West End of London when they were shooting A Hard Day's Night, the audience scenes in A Hard Day's Night, the closing TV special they're making. 
And he's backstage phoning the publisher going, tell me about this speech again. What have I got to do? Have I really got to do it? He's locked into something and he's realizing, oh, I don't want to do this. And that's when he decides he won't do it. He'll be there, he'll sign the books, and he'll pose for photographs, but he won't do the speech. And I had read, I don't know if you wrote this or not, but that he had quite a hangover that day, and that, that was part of it. Did you ever read that anywhere? I don't know. That may be right. I'm not sure. Any day that. that could be right. <laughs> well, they, you know, they were busy guys, but they were young guys. A drink was part and parcel of their daily life, mm -hmm. um, as it is for so many people. And there was a lot of pressure on them, and I, they did drink a fair bit, the Beatles. But whether he was particularly hungover that day, I'm not yeah. sure. What it really was, was that he didn't want to do the expected thing. He was considered, in the wake of the Royal Variety Show, when he told the audience they could rattle their jewellery, right. which basically was speaking to the royal family in that sense. In the wake of that, he was considered to be this great wit who could get up and entertain, you know, do a, a witty speech for 20 minutes. And really, that wasn't his forte at all. He was much more ad-libbing and off the cuff than that. So that's really what he was. He didn't want to get up and make a witty dinner speech. So in your books that are forthcoming, you will omit things that we think happened, but you won't cite those things as not being true. You just... I'll judge it in the moment. Some of them I may, but um, mostly I'll just be concerned with what actually right. did happen. And, and I'm still learning. Well, there's plenty to learn. Now there's a myth that was debunked that you undebunked the debunkle. So. <laughs> <laughs> now I've heard a comic is the person who actually said, Pete might be a better drummer, but Ringo's a better Beatle. Did John say that? There was no way that they ever considered that Pete was a better drummer than Ringo. <laughs> yeah. So I can't imagine that he would have said that. I mean, one of the myths that I haven't debunked in the book, no, actually, I did debunk it in the book, is that there is this comment that uh, John Lennon said Ringo wasn't even the best drummer in the Beatles. Right. And that is certainly untrue. Okay. It's an interesting thing, this, because Ringo has been in the Beatles has been a Beatle since 1962, but initially through the 60s, very little consideration was given to, in people's minds, to what he was giving the Beatles as a band. And it's only now, for some reason, that people are realizing what a fantastic drummer he yes. is. I don't know why it, it took so long. And, and he was always the figure of fun and just like, well, you know, he was the lucky guy. He was the chosen one. They chose him. Of all the people they could have asked to be their drummer, they chose him. And they got rid of Pete. And, and they chose Ringo. And they chose him because they knew what they were doing. I'm really having fun setting the record straight with you because no one really in the world knows more about the Beatles than you do, I don't I, think. I, I always hesitate to agree to that kind of compliment. Yes, but it's true. So you, don't, you need not agree. <laughs> <laughs> I've said it. That makes it true. All right. All right. <laughs> You could quote me on that. But one thing I read was that when Ringo sat in with them either in Hamburg when he was with Roy Storm or, or maybe it was in Liverpool somewhere, mm. that John and Paul looked to each other and said, you know, we've never sounded this good before. And, it's, and George, of course, loved Ringo. Yes. It's a natural feeling for people who look at the Beatles' lives and career and have an interest in it to look at Pete and see the fact that he was dismissed on the proverbial eve of their in incredible breakthrough, and then the worldwide fame and the riches, and this guy missed out because they got rid of him just beforehand. And there is a natural affinity, the, a humanity, if you like, that people have, and they extend it to Pete and feel very, very sorry for the man. But in reality, bands change personnel all the time. Right. And if you are a musician, the Beatles had the most dynamic front line of all time. On the right, you've got John Lennon. In the middle, or kind of closer to John, you've got Paul, who's standing with George, or George and Paul, you know, that they would stand on the left of the stage as we would see it, and John would stand on the right. And that is the ultimate in front lines. Behind them, they had a drummer in Pete Best who they considered wasn't a very good drummer for what they were trying to achieve. They were consistently frustrated with him. And Pete had this shyness about him that he was projecting. He didn't make eye contact with anybody, including his bandmates. So they would turn around as musicians do to look at the drummer, to, to count in or to you know nod about where the break's going to be. And he's not looking at them. Right. And that was enormously frustrating for them. When Ringo was sat in with them initially before he joined them, it swung. And if you're in a band, that makes all the difference. The chemistry is wrong or the chemistry is right. Now, they did make huge strides with Pete 
they got themselves to the brink of fame with Pete. Right. But that really didn't owe to Pete. It owed to the front line. And, yes. and when they as musicians said, we don't need, we should get rid of him and have somebody else. We should have Ringo. It felt right. If you've been in a band, you know what that means. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, as you said, Ringo was the chosen one. Mm. Pete was the last resort. They needed a drummer, and Paul had put adverts in the mm. Liverpool Echo and, and everywhere. They tried everywhere to get a drummer. Actually, what happened was Paul responded to an advert, a remarkable advertisement, just when they were looking for a drummer. A drummer advertised himself looking for a position. Oh, okay. And Paul got in touch with him, and that letter has now surfaced. Oh. But it, it just didn't work out for that guy. In fact, by the time he read Paul's reply, they'd gone to <laughs> Hamburg because they were in a real hurry. This is not to say that Pete didn't give them something because he did. He was a right. great, great looking guy. And he, in Hamburg with them, they forged this kind of four in the bar, boom, 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 this kind of Max Schau sound that did initially, when they returned to Liverpool, carry them a long way. So there's no doubt that Pete was an important part of the Beatles. But ultimately, he, they didn't want him. Right. And it really wouldn't have worked with Pete going forward. I mean, can you imagine Pete Best on the drums on the Ed Sullivan show or, you know, Hard Day's Night and Help are both kind of built around Ringo. Right. They wouldn't have built it around Pete. No. And he barely spoke. Pete brought on a great deal of that empathy because he came over here and did all those silly television shows, What's My Line or whatever those shows. And it's always poor Pete, you know. And, and he, yes. But he played the role of the melancholy Dane, except he's British. Yeah. <laughs> and, he, you know, he, he's always got his head down. And his jokes don't work. You know? No, I mean, he, he's a very nice man, Pete. I genuinely like the guy. Yeah. I mean, I've only ever had nice times with him, but you can just see that in terms of personality, you've got three dynamic guys on the front line and someone who is undynamic at the back, and that didn't work. I've always contended that, from my point of view, and I was only nine when they hit here, but the name Ringo Starr helped. I mean, yes. that's we knew Ringo. That's the first Beatle name we all knew over here. Yes, yes. America was the making of Ringo. Right. I mean, he'd been well established in the band, but in his own head, he still felt somehow like it was their band and, and he was the fourth guy. But coming to America and getting that particular focus of attention did change things for him. And, uh, I mean, Ringo is an American name. Right. It's a cowboy. Yeah, Johnny name. Ringo, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he got it. It was because he wore the rings on his fingers, but also he loved cowboys and Gene mm. Autry and all of that, and it's an American name. Yeah. Mm. Were you a fan of the Beatles when they came to the U.S.? Or were you alive? I don't even know yes. how old you are. Okay. Yes, I was alive, and yes, I was a fan of the Beatles. But I, in the U.K., we never had the Ed Sullivan Show on our TV. I mean, did you know they came here and conquered, or was that newsworthy there oh it was massive okay. it was massive because british acts had never broken through in america there were isolated incidents in fact at the very end of 62 beginning of 63 the number one single on billboard and cashbox was telstar an instrumental recorded in london by an english band called the tornadoes the beatles were everybody knew they were english mm -hmm. and what's more they were from liverpool not even from london and the fact that they came to america and smashed it wide open was huge news back home. They were our boys. Yeah. And they had gone and made this tremendous achievement. And England, Britain was very proud of the Beatles at that time. But that did change over the years. By the end of the 60s, Britain was less proud of the Beatles. But they had all these other acts anyway. Yeah, it's a British thing anyway to turn on our own, <laughs> our own champions. And one thing that certainly people around here may not understand, and it's different now somewhat, but not really. Can you explain the London-Liverpool attitude yeah. at the time, and especially at that time? Yeah, especially at that time, it's still prevalent today. England is a small country. You know, London is in the south. Not the furthest south, but it is essentially the south of England, and Liverpool is in the north of England. And yet there's only 200 miles apart, because it's not a big place. But it, that's enough. It's enough for there to be a divide. There is a north-south divide in many ways in English life. And certainly Liverpool was always looked upon. It was a, a very important city when Britain had its empire, because it was a port, a great shipping port. Nonetheless, through most of the 20th century, Liverpool was in decline, and post-war, particularly post-1945, it was in a very sorry state because it had been badly blitzed by the Germans. Because of uh, its importance as a port city. Because of its importance. There actually was a plan by the Germans to wipe Liverpool off the map. And they had a pretty good go at it. They didn't defeat Britain 
thanks to the Americans. But nonetheless, Liverpool took a terrible pounding, as well as a great many other cities in, in the UK. But Liverpool was very slow to pick itself up, up off the floor. And when the Beatles broke through in 63, the city was still full of bomb sites. And it was also a place of great poverty. And it was also a particularly Irish city mm -hmm. because of its proximity to Ireland. You know, you get on a boat in Ireland, you come to Liverpool. And they did in the famine. And they did. And that's how my book Tune In begins with the potato famine expelling, in essence, uh, more than a million Irish into well, out of Ireland and into Liverpool, often from Liverpool across the Atlantic to the eastern seaboard of the United States. But of course, a great many stayed in Liverpool full of disease and poverty and famine. And England and Ireland, you know, historically have a lot of problems with Britain's occupation of Ireland. And the potato famine really owed to the fact that the British were keeping them in, in subjugation. And so because Liverpool is such an Irish city, it's not looked upon very kindly by the rest of the country, historically. Less so now than it used to be, but that was the view through most of the 20th century. So Liverpool was in a really bad place. I mean, it was, it was broken, it was bombed, it was poverty-stricken, high unemployment, high crime rate. And for the fact that the Beatles came from there was extraordinary, because how could something so wonderful come from such a place? Especially all of them, all four of them. All four of them. Like around here, you know, we have great bands emerge from time to time, but one's from Oklahoma and one's from Texas and one's from New England or somewhere, or yes. California, certainly. Yeah. And then for those to come from that, not only any city, but that city. Yes. It's, it's yes. unthinkable. It's a musical city, Liverpool, because of the Irish influence particularly. Right. There's also Scottish and Welsh influence there, and the English like music too. But it is a, Liverpool is a melting pot with a particularly heavy Irish accent. And that makes it a musical. Everyone sang. And parties, everyone would have their turn. So you go around the room and everyone would get up and sing something or recite something. They would have their thing at a party. And so Liverpool people are natural performers and ebullient with it. And it was, as I discovered when researching Tune In, to my own surprise, the only place in the world in the late 1950s, early 60s with a rock and roll scene. The only place. There would be clubs in certain cities. New York had a club here, a club there. There would be clubs around. But the only place in the world where musicians could actually turn professional and play seven nights a week for money was Liverpool. If you read all the other books, you would think that John and Paul and George, to some extent, just waited for the ships to come in and the sailors to throw the 45. But someone said that that's not really... The sailors bringing the records in wasn't really the way that they learned. Yes. Is that you? It was me. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. It was so. me. Well, in fact, Bob Wooler, who is a, an integral figure in the first book, you might read on Wikipedia say that he was the DJ at the cavern, which he was, but he was much, much more than that. He was emphatic that Cunard Yanks, so-called, the, the sailors from Liverpool who would go across to America and bring things back to Liverpool, did not have any part in the Beatles' repertoire. And this is true. Paul McCartney also said the same. All the American music the Beatles covered, which was pretty much in their entire repertoire before they were famous, they got from records that were released in the UK by licensing deals from American labels. So there were lots of obscure American records, but they were released in the UK and they heard the UK copies in shops in Liverpool, typically Brian Epstein's shop, NEMS, where they would go into the little listening booths called browseries and ask the girl behind the counter to put the record on. And they would be in there listening to it and they'd be trying to memorise it. And they'd often go on and play it that night, wherever wow. they were playing. Oh, so I never realised the logistics of that. So why don't you explain the whole NEMS thing, Epstein and the well, shop? Yeah, I mean, in those days, every city, every town had record shops. Sometimes they sold other things as well. Electrical appliances was typical. The washing machines, televisions, radios or stereograms, you know, all those kind of old domestic appliances. And there would be a record department or record counter. There was even near where Ringo lived, a bicycle shop that had a record counter. <laughs> <laughs> but in the case of Liverpool, there were many good record shops, but the best was a place called NEMS, North End Music Stores, which had two branches in Liverpool City Centre. And they were, the NEMS was owned by the Epstein family, the Epstein family. Both pronunciations are correct. 
because the family called themselves Epstein, but Brian said it was Epstein. Oh, so, okay. So I often say Brian Epstein and his brother Clive Epstein because that's, <laughs> that's how they were. Well, that explains it because Vivek Tuari, you know him. Yes, he's, oh, Vivek, yes. He, yeah, he argues on the Steen side, and then Tony Bramwell worked for him, and he calls him Stein. So it's yes. Stein if it's Brian and Steen if it's anyone else. If it's the family, yes, okay. that's right. So they owned NEMS as a company, and these two city centre stores were run by Brian and his brother Clive. Okay. They were known to the staff as Mr. Brian and Mr. Clive. And these were really good stores, and Brian in particular was ambitious that they should be the best in the north of England. And by all accounts, from people who used to travel around record stores, they were. I mean, I read that Brian Epstein managed a record department or managed a record shop or worked in a record shop. Well, yes, he did, but actually he also owned the business and managed it in every sense. So he was in complete control of what this store looked like, how it was designed, how it was laid out, and also what it stocked and the way that it served the public. And Brian was brilliant at that kind of thing. And he did run the best store in the north of England. And so the Beatles were regularly in there, particularly if they played the cavern at lunchtime. They wouldn't necessarily want to go back out to the suburbs where they lived because they would be back in the city a few hours later. Right. They'd hang around in the record stores listening to whatever was new from America. And they would hear it in Brian's shop. This goes to the myth. Someone came in, asked for my Bonnie. Yeah. And Brian didn't have it. Was it Alice? Who? Uh, Raymond uh, Jones. Raymond Jones yes. was the... The name. Yes. Is there a Raymond Jones? Did he ask for it? Is that a true story? There is a Raymond Jones. He did ask for it. It is a true story. It's not a myth. Where Brian said that he kind of hadn't heard of them before and went down to the cavern to find out more about the record, that is true, but not necessarily the whole truth. He must have known of because he wrote a column for the fortnightly music paper Mersey Beat that Bill Harry launched. And the Beatles were regularly in that, in fact, usually on the cover. Mm -hmm. They were on the cover of the second issue, and inside it is a piece by Brian. He would have seen their photo. He would have seen their name. But it was the inquiry about my body that took him to the cavern. You met Peter Sullivan this week, and he, of course, ended up at DECA with Dick Rowe. Mm -hmm. And the way he tells the story of the another myth that Dick Rowe turned down the Beatles because guitar bands were out, he lays most of the blame on Mike Smith, Mm. And for choosing Brian and the Tremolos, do you, what's your take on that whole thing? I really looked at this in great depth of tuning to try to get to the bottom of it because there's a lot of contradictory testimony out there. And why don't you describe what I'm talking about? Yeah. So some people. Basically, know. what happens is that in November '61, Brian sees the Beatles. He offers to be their manager even before they have had their first proper meeting to discuss it. He's been down to London to see if he can get. EMI interested in the Beatles. And also, they have a recording contract already at that point. It's the one that they've just signed with the German record producer Bert Kempfert in Hamburg. They'd signed that in June 61. And now in November, December, Brian is trying to get them a British contract. But it could well be that the rights are already taken by Bert Kempford. And indeed they were. It was someone at EMI who very kindly got the contract translated. The Beatles had signed it with no knowledge of what they signed because it was in German. And they just signed it. And Brian said, well, we need to know what it is you signed. And so they got it translated. And indeed, Bert Kempford did have the rights to the Beatles, but Brian wrote to him and Bert agreed to relinquish his rights. So then how could Brian get them a British deal? Well, he tried EMI, but he tried it in a strange way. He said to them, here's this record they've made in Germany, My Bonnie, but don't listen to the singer because he's not really with the band. Just listen to the backing group. So that wasn't the best start. Right. But then he gets them a test with Decca. And they come down to London on New Year's Eve, 62, to the studio in West Hampstead. The building is still there. I've been in the studio. And they do 15 numbers. The guy, Mike Smith, who's taking the session, has already seen them in the cavern and been blown away by them. Now he wants to test them in the studio. How good are they in a recording studio? And he did like them. But his boss, Dick Rowe, said to him, you can only sign one of these two bands. You've also auditioned one called Brian Poole and the Tremolos choose. And he chose Brian Poole and the Tremolos, partly because, well, for a number of reasons, one of them, the principal one being that they lived in London. And he had this idea that the group he was going to sign wasn't only going to be recording under their own right, under their own name, but would also be 
providing backing for other artists. Oh. And it would be much easier to have this group who lived in London anyway, since the studio was in London. The Beatles were 200 miles away, which seemed like a very long way. Mm -hmm. So it was easier all round to go for Brian Poole and the Tremolos. The Beatles didn't do a great test, but it also wasn't bad. And he had seen them in the cavern, so he did know how brilliant they were. But nonetheless, that was the decision taken by Smith, but because Rowe wouldn't let him sign too. So Rowe was involved with that. The remarkable thing that I always find with the Beatles is that just when you're looking to research something deeply, more pieces of the puzzle come to play if you research it right where you would wish them to. And in the very week that the Beatles were turned down by Decker, well, in fact, there's more to that answer than more to that statement than that I've just said. But in that very week, Dick Rowe was on the cover of a music paper in London saying we're having an aggressive pro-British signing policy. And then he's turning down the Beatles in the same breath. Mm. So uh, perfectly timed <laughs> for that to be contradictory. He had also Rowe just been over to the United States and was interested in America always led the trends. So he thought, well, whatever's in America now will be our trend in the UK soon. And there were no bands like the Beatles in America either. Right. In fact, one of the things I discovered when writing the book, people always talk about those days, oh, well, there were groups everywhere. There weren't really. There was in Liverpool, mm -hmm. because Liverpool had the scene. But elsewhere, self-contained groups, three guitars and drums, really barely existed, certainly in the collective popular consciousness what we know as a band today the whole rock band era really begins with the beatles that doesn't mean they were the first ever because there was the crickets and there was the shadows and so on but the huge popularization of bands called the something with bass rhythm lead drums singing their own song or singing in harmony and often writing their own songs that owes exactly and only to the beatles and i've read it somewhere that john lennon was the first one to even coin the term band for that combination that they were combos or groups or whatever well they were a group really the Beatles. they used to like to call themselves a band yeah but in those days the parlance of the period was group skiffle group jazz band oh okay jazz, jazz was band. always band you never heard we didn't often hear jazz group you would hear jazz band but you would hear skiffle group pop group for yeah. some reason there was that distinction and the beatles did like to call themselves a band but in really they also called themselves a group most of the time in the next two books i will be referring to them as a group because that was the vocabulary of the day okay and we're talking with mark lewison right now and while we're setting the record straight rather than debunking myths we're just setting the record straight mm. the name the beatles yes how'd that happen it was march 1960 we are a month away we are just in fact a few weeks away now from the 60th anniversary of the coining of the name Beatles. It was the last days of March 1960. It happened in the student flat that John shared with Stuart, Stuart Sutcliffe, the Beatles' original bass player, in Gambia Terrace in Liverpool, very close to the art school that they went to. And being that they had the flat, Paul and George, who were a fair bit younger than John, used to go and stay there overnight sometimes. Very exciting. Paul still has very evocative memories of that flat and waking up there. It's the first time they ever really got to have a, like a sleep out somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Not at home, but go and share it in a you know, bunk down on the floor somewhere in their mate's flat. And they were the quarry men. They toyed with other names, Johnny and the Moon Dogs. They'd been J Page Three, but they weren't really sure of the name that they most wanted to have. So what were we talking about? How the Beatles got their name. Yes. That's where we were. And I was yeah. saying that it's actually 60 years at the end of March 2020 since the name was coined. They had been the Quarrymen when uh, that was John's original group, the Quarrymen. And that was because he went to Quarry Bank High School in Liverpool. So his group was the Quarrymen because they were in essence a school group at that time. And the name had stuck, but they weren't ever that fond of it. They had called themselves J Page Three when John, Paul and George were a trio. They called themselves Johnny and the Moon Dogs to play an audition, kind of um, like a talent contest in Manchester in the north of England. But the name Quarrymen hadn't quite ever gone away. They hadn't really replaced it with anything definitive. And at the end of March 1960, John and Stuart came up. I think it may have actually been Stuart who said what about Beatles? And the thinking was that um, they liked the fact that Buddy Holly's group, The Crickets, 
was an insect, but it had a second meaning. And the second meaning, which was truer in the UK than in America, is that we have a sport called cricket. Ah, yes. And sure enough, when the crickets came to England in 1958, they posed for publicity pictures with English cricketers. Holly wouldn't have thought of that, I don't think. Oh, no, no. So, I mean, he just thought of it as uh, one meaning, but in the UK it had two. And that was in the Beatles' mind. If they called themselves Beatles, it's the insect. And again, the fact that it's an insect is indicative. It's come from the crickets, really. And But also, they played beat music, because that's what it was called in those days, beat music. And John, who was loved wordplay, changed the double E to an E-A, the B E A. T-L-E-S. And that was an incredible thing for them to decide because no other groups in that period of time in Liverpool were called the something. Uh-huh. They were all, it was Johnny Sandon and the Remo Four, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, King Size Taylor and the Dominoes, Gus Travis and the Midnighters, and then the Beatles. And therefore that ticked what we would now say tick boxes for the Beatles. They didn't use that phrase then, but it made them different. They always wanted to be different. And for certain, that name was disliked by everybody who heard it. (laughs) And that appealed to them as well, because they liked the fact that their name got up people's noses. And sure enough, a couple of years later, when Brian Epstein is shopping the Beatles around, trying to get London record companies interested in them, recurringly, it was said to him, change the name, they'll never get anywhere with a name like Beatles. But of course, it was a brilliant name. And the Beatles always had the courage of their convictions. Just because people said to them, if you don't change your name, you won't make it. They said, stuff it, we're not changing it. We'll make it our way. And the Beatles breakthrough was done from Liverpool, not from London. They eventually moved to London, but the breakthrough came from Liverpool with a name that nobody liked, that everybody said would never get them anywhere because they had the courage of their convictions. And it seems that I've seen a picture of a drum head, either with it spelled with two E's and a more of a cursive with an antenna coming yes. off of it. Like yes. a, to infer the beetles, the bug, the insect. Amazingly, in all the time that Pete Best was with them, they never had their name on the drum head. Uh, he says that they did for a while, but it's not in any photograph. We have no photographs of the Beatles with Pete with the name on the drum head. And when they got Ringo in, he had his own name on the drum head. It said Ringo Starr. Oh. It didn't say the Beatles. And that's how they went out for the first three, four months that Ringo was in the band, it looked like the band was called Ringo Starr. Uh And it was only in January 63 that Paul, I think it was, spoke to a man called Tex O'Hara, who they knew in Liverpool. He was the brother of Brian O'Hara from The Foremost. Mm. And he was a designer. And he designed them the drum head that they used for the next few months, which had antennae sprouting from the bee in Beatles. Mm. And when the Beatles signed autographs or wrote letters to their fans, which they would, they would always reply to the fans who wrote to them. They would often draw the little logo with the antennae on the back of the envelope that they sent back to the fan. And that was Paul's design. There are sketches of him doing that, of his putting that together. It was only in, I think, May 63 that the classic Beatle drumhead with the drop T came into being. That was done unasked of a man who did drumhead designs for Drum City, which was a musical instrument shop in the West End of London. Drum City. And the guy there, I think his surname was Stokes. I might be getting that wrong. But uh, he just said, you should have your name on the drums. How about this? And they said, yeah, OK, we'll use that. And they didn't copyright it until the 80s i think something like oh that. really mm-hmm. that's funny that that one's got through the cracks having spent some time with billy j kramer and tony bramwell these mm-hmm. are my key sources on this one is that they worshiped brian epstein you know there's a rumor out there a myth or basic philosophy that epstein was no good mm-hmm. because he had no experience but no one had any experience in that because there never had been mm-hmm. beatles So what do you think of the whole Epstein situation? Well, we talked a a while ago about Ringo, that Ringo was the chosen one. Brian was the chosen one as well in that, although he made the pitch to them, let me manage you, I believe I can achieve for you the breakthroughs that you want. They ultimately had the decision, do we want this guy to manage us or don't we? John Lennon, particular quote from him is, we'll allow you to manage us. It's not like the other way, not like we were manipulative. And 
in the myth in Liverpool is that anybody else, you know, Sam Leach might have managed them or Bill Harry might have managed them or Ray McFall at the Cavern might have managed them or anybody else. No, the Beatles wouldn't have had anybody else. They knew all these guys and they didn't want them. They knew they were OK with them. They didn't dislike these people. They were all part of the scene together, but the Beatles didn't want them as their manager. They did want Brian. And the fact that Brian was a beginner at it was actually to their advantage because the other managers who, who were around the architect type of pop manager in the UK before Brian Epstein was a man called Larry Parnes. Larry Parnes didn't, he had the opportunity to take the Beatles and didn't see what they had, but also it would have been a disaster because what Brian recognized almost immediately with the Beatles was that you can't tell these guys what to do. You have to show them the possibilities and let them decide. And he recognized that from the start and all of the Beatles' great creativity, all the triumphs that they had throughout the 1960s, the singles, the albums, the tours, the Shea Stadiums, everything, the Ed Sullivan Show, the Royal Variety Performance, all the triumphs were all enabled by Brian. Brian was the great enabler. They had the talent, but he gave them all the opportunities to be triumphant. And then they went in and, and did it. And he was a brilliant manager for the Beatles and the only man who could have done it. And I resent the fact that people, that he has been scarred or slurred into people assuming he was a bad manager because of certain things that people don't even really understand. And really, I lay the blame for all this on Philip Norman, the mm -hmm. writer of Shout, who I used to be friends of, friends with, and indeed I was his researcher for a while. But he slanted Brian as a cack-handed man who made catastrophic business decisions for the Beatles, and he didn't. He really didn't. You can look at certain things in isolation and say he could have done this or that better. That's with the benefit of hindsight and with a certain lack of knowledge of really what the situation was at the time those decisions were taken. But it also doesn't take into account the phenomenal number of triumphs. I mean, my contention is if you've got a sports team that is consistently top of the league, winning everything year on year on year on year on year, are you really going to say the manager is rubbish? Yes, <laughs> that's impossible. And even if you really research, like I read Shout, the first Shout and most of the second Shout, and you're right, and then he plays up, and others do, the cell tab, Beatles spelled backwards thing. But they corrected that and mm. really in not too long of a period of time. The whole merchandising thing has never been reported properly, and it's the stick with the people most used to beat Brian about the head with, and they don't even, people who do that beating don't really understand. They've read certain things in certain books, which were in a sense slanted against Brian as well. And I'm not here to defend Brian. I'm not going to be defending Brian. Brian doesn't need defending and I'm not attacking or defending anybody in these books. But I, what I am going to do is report on paper all the things that my deep research has found. And the readers can make up their own mind about whether it was a catastrophic blunder or not. In my opinion, it wasn't, but it may, with certain tellings, be seen to be so with the benefit of hindsight and the evolution of an industry in the last 50 years that simply wasn't in place at the time. Right. He created that industry, really. The Beatles did. I yeah. mean, the merchandising industry before the Beatles was bigger in America than in the UK. It was virtually non-existent in the UK or anywhere else. In America, there had been the David Crockett phenomenon and Elvis to a degree. But in fact, the sums of money I read, Brian lost them $100 million. I've yeah. seen the accounts of Celtab and there was nothing like that amount of money being generated then. And besides which, it wasn't Brian who signed the deal. It was a man called David Jacobs, who was his lawyer in London. And it seemed to be a good deal. And I was in the Musicians Hall of Fame. I saw the agreement that Chet Atkins had with Gretsch so they could name a guitar after him. And it was 5%. Yeah. You know, I mean, this was the standard kind of deal in those days. The business as it, as it evolved was very different and slanted much more heavily in favor of the artist. And you can understand why. But you don't go straight to that point. You know, that is something that has to be achieved gradually. And particularly from the experience of others and from the maturation of the market. And Epstein, to his credit, enlisted the best attorneys in London, mm -hmm. the best CPA or accounting firms there. Yes. He had Weiss over here. He had great representation who were supposed to be protected. He's not supposed to know the law. I mean, that's, he would never 
Yeah. He never passed himself off as a yes. lawyer. Also, the Beatles had plenty of money. It's not yeah. like, you know, he lost them a fortune. They would have had more money if that deal had been done differently with the benefit of hindsight, et cetera, et cetera. But they had plenty. And also the taxation in those days was amazingly high. And they wouldn't have kept much of this extra money that Brian allegedly lost them anyway. It would have gone to the tax man. Right, because it really was one for you, 19 for me. Uh -huh. I mean, one for me, 19 for you. 91, 91.25% 91. was the taxation rate in the UK for high earners in the 1960s. Unbelievable. 91. So it was even, one for you, 19 for me is what, 95%. Yeah. So it was pretty close pretty to Pretty close. That. Yeah. Unbelievable. And then I think back on the money he did or didn't lose them. In Hard Day's Night, for example. Mm. I read that United Artists was ready to give them some massive percentage of the film. He got them 25% of the gross. And then someone said that the deal he cut when he renewed the Parlophone EMI mm -hmm. contract mm -hmm. for the higher percentage rate was better than what Klein was getting people because Epstein or whoever wrote the thing mm -hmm. got it for the new rate was on any release mm -hmm. at all, yes. including past masters and things. Whereas mm -hmm. the Who, I think, that was Dalton said that they still had their old rate on their old stuff, even when CDs and cassettes and yes. things came out. Yes. So he, I don't know if it was foresight or if it was luck, but he got them more money. He, whatever the, they think he didn't make them, he made it back. In the he made plenty for them. I mean, of course, it was always with the Beatles. It's their talent. <laughs> it's their songwriting. It's their musicianship. It's their personalities. They are the front. But behind the scenes, Brian gave them for 25%, which people go, 25%? The Who were on 50%. Kit and Chris took 50% of the Who's money. The Stones were on 25% with Andrew Lou Golden and Eric Easton. And for their 25%, the Beatles' entire lives were managed by Brian's office. It wasn't just, we're going to you know, book you into Shea Stadium and take 25%. Everything they ever needed in their private lives, in their homes, in the running of their marriages and the raising of their children and whatever it might be, was all done through Brian's office and it all came from that same fee. Well, good old Brian. Well, as we saw, when Brian died, everything changed. Yeah. That's not to say that they wouldn't have changed anyway. And their own relationship was evolving. They didn't really need a manager in the way that they had needed one. But nonetheless, what Brian gave them was fantastic. And things did shift when he died. Speaking of things John Lennon may or may not have said, did he say you stick with the percentages and we'll handle the music? Is that... Yes. Well, that we know that story because Brian himself told it. Brian had the same candor and honesty as the Beatles did, which was pretty much 100%. So in his own memoir, A Cellar Full of Noise, he tells that story. We know that story that is anti-Brian because Brian told us. And it's a recording session where Brian reaches forward, presses the intercom button and says, boys, I think, you know, slightly out of tune on that note or something. Brian was prone to fits of grandeur, that's for sure. And John who always was there with a cutting remark, said, will you count the money and we'll do the music or yeah. words to that effect? Um, which was fair. Yeah. Which was perfectly fair. And it's Lennon. I mean, that's the way he was. It was Lennon and it's the way he was. I pick up of these days in 2020 on some anti-John Lennon stuff these days. Then some allegedly cutting-edge comedian who's done a piece on the BBC website that is very strongly anti-John Lennon. But he's picked his bits to attack him for without looking at the overwhelming number of bits he could have chosen that are just wonderful yeah he was a complicated man that's for of sure. course he was complicated but it was john lennon's personality paul mccartney's personality george harrison's personality and ringo Starr's personality that made the beatles the magical combination that they were and if you start picking apart this or that then you don't get strawberry fields forever or you don't get eleanor rigby or you don't get while my guitar gently weeps or you don't get octopus's garden you know what i yeah. mean it's just like they were who they were and the talent that they had and the personality that they put it across with is part and parcel of them as people so i don't want to be picking away at things yeah. Like, oh, yeah, if only he hadn't done this if only he hadn't done that who's perfect in life right i watch a hard day's night about three times a year uh, i just love that movie and is that the essence of the personalities of the individuals of the beatles well if you listen to the Wenner interview that John gave in 1970 to Rolling Stone, he would tell you that actually that did them some damage in that it gave people a slightly false picture of who and how they were. But actually, I think, though he was entitled to that opinion, of course, and he knew what he was talking about, perhaps remembering certain incidents that followed that he didn't elucidate in the interview, 
Overwhelmingly, Alan Owen, the writer of A Hard Day's Night, did a brilliant job in capturing their personalities. He didn't spend that much time with them before he wrote the script, but he wrote a brilliant script. I thought so. And the Beatles really do come across, as they did in everything else at that time, and always, in fact, as naturally, and themselves. <laughs> so if there was some enlargement of their personalities, it was only a little one. It wasn't massively, it wasn't completely out of kilter with who they were or the way they were. You could recognisably believe that those four guys were pretty much the four guys as they would be off camera. Alan Owen's script was wonderful. Dick Lester's direction, superb. Oh, yes. Everything, the design of that film, the economy of it, the little in-jokes, many of which wouldn't have meant much outside the UK, but nonetheless, the film travelled. There was someone at UA who said, we should dub American voices onto these guys <laughs> because the American audiences may not be able to follow what they're saying. That was stamped on immediately. No one would have countenanced that. But A Hard Day's Night is another of Brian Epstein's triumphs, yeah. as well as a triumph for everybody else involved in, the, in its making, because it is a perfect piece of art. Yeah, I Therefore, think the black and whiteness of it really contributed to it. I don't think it would have played as well in color. It's hard to say, but I wouldn't want to see it colorized. No. I mean, it is just a brilliant film, and everyone involved in it can still hold their heads very high. And Brian Epstein knew that the Beatles wanted to make the right film. It's a key part of the understanding of the Beatles is that before they made A Hard Day's Night, they turned down several opportunities to be in films because they had an innate sense of the kind of film they should not make. They should not fall into the trap that everybody else had fallen into of picking the wrong script or being in somebody else's film in some little cameo role. The hallmark of the Beatles is we'll do it our way or we won't do it at all. They ran the risk of never being in a film by holding out for the film that they wanted to make. And then, hey presto, along comes Walter Shenson, Richard Lester, Alan Owen, with Brian Epstein, them and the supporting cast, they put together this perfect film for United Artists. And you've got a great piece of art that they were risking not making. They would rather not make a film than make the wrong one, and then they made the right one. It's extraordinary to think, too, that when you really look at the Beatles, and sometimes, and this is another sort of a knock on Epstein, so he signs with them in November, and then people say, well, the Beatles were angry because it was taking him too long. He got them an audition in a month. I mean, that's, that's not bad. An audition in a month. They were in the charts within a year of signing his management. Within 15 months of signing, they're number one. 12 months on after that, they're on The Ed Sullivan Show. And the Ed Sullivan Show, incidentally, which is the focal point of you know the great plate-moving moment in American culture of the late 20th century. The myth on that one that actually needs a little bit of revision is that that was what broke the Beatles in America. The Beatles were already broken. They just broke even bigger. Right. The Sullivan Show was obviously a seismic moment, but they had already changed the American music industry on its head before the Sullivan Show. They heard they were number one when they were in Paris. It was January the 15th, 1964, that they got the telegram saying that you're number one in America. Having looked at this really carefully, that was based on sales up to, I haven't got my notes, but I think it's like the 9th or the 10th of January. So they've shot to number one with the record released on December 26. By the 9th or 10th of January, in terms of the computation of that chart, that's a month before Sullivan. Yeah. And according to Bruce Spicer, mm -hmm. that was an accident, too, that some stewardess or, or someone brought I Want to Hold Your Hand back to Baltimore and got some DJ to start playing it. And then New York picked it up somehow, right? Yeah. Carol James on WWDC, <laughs> okay. Washington, D.C., had a request from a girl called Marsha Albert of Silver Spring, Maryland, to play I Want to Hold Your Hand. And he couldn't get it. So he knew someone, a stewardess on BOAC, the airline, and she brought a copy from England and ended up on the air on WWDC. And that set it off. And Capitol Records was forced by pressure to bring forward the release date to December 26. I think it was planned for a date in early January. And it just flew day by day. They couldn't press them fast enough. So this is a month before Sullivan. It's already flying. It's already the explosion has occurred. But Sullivan just magnified it. 73 and, million people. And another knock on Epstein, which is unfounded or wrong, is that they only got $3,500 per show. But for one thing, that's a lot of money back then. Mm -hmm. And second,
second, look what it did. I mean, it, they should have paid $10 million for that. <laughs> How anybody can criticize anything that led to the Beatles being on the Ed Sullivan show, it boggles the mind. Yes. $3,500 for three shows. So that's multiplied by three. I think it is. I haven't got the contract in front of me. So 10000 by, I think. And their airfares as well. Uh, and I think there was something extra thrown in as well. I, I will get it right in the book. Where I'll have the contract in front of me yeah. when I write it. And there's another thing about this. Uniquely Brian Epstein. He never wanted the Beatles to be second fiddle on anything. So a key part of the deal that no one ever thinks about now is that when he struck that contract with Ed Sullivan for three shows, that they would be top of the bill yeah. on the Ed Sullivan show. They weren't just going to be on the Ed Sullivan show. They're going to be top of the bill on the Ed Sullivan show because he didn't want them second on the bill or third on the bill. He held out for that. And Ed was big enough to go for that. And they didn't have a hit when he wrote the contract. No, but in England, in England, Beatlemania was around, and that was becoming a news story that was being picked up on by a lot of American newspapers. Before the Beatles were heard in America by many people, they were reading about this thing that was happening in England where kids were screaming and camping out overnight outside theatres and the royal family being upstaged by these four long-haired singers. So that was the story that Ed really bought into. And as for Ed being at London Airport on the 31st of October when the Beatles are coming back from Sweden, I don't think he was there. Really? Mm -hmm. I, I really don't <laughs> think he happen. was there. I think that's a made-up story. Oh, that's interesting. And I wonder who made that up, Sullivan? I guess. Ed. Yeah. Ed. Well, that's mm. okay, too. Yeah. He needed then, an excuse. Well, which surprises me. I don't know why he felt he needed an excuse, because he read Variety every week, and Variety had quite a lot of Beatles stories in 63. Yeah. And also, Ed had a spy in London, a man called Peter Pritchard, who worked for the Grade Organization, whose job it was to provide British and other international continental talent for Ed's show. Because Ed Sullivan's show was a true variety show, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it would have, you know, puppeteers on it and tumbling acts and all of that. A lot of those were European, and they were recommended by Peter Pritchard. And Peter Pritchard was pushing the Beatles to Ed from the spring. Oh, okay. Ed was in England in April 63. He knew about the Beatles. For some reason, he decided to make up a story about them being at London Airport and yeah. the, this place being he overrun with kids. He thought the Queen had landed or something. Yeah, yeah, I don't know why he felt the need to do that, because in a sense, it negated his own intelligence. Mm -hmm. He had intelligence fed to him from London, and he was reading Variety. Wow. So we've gotten through to Hard Day's Nights. So we've passed your first book. Yeah. When will your second be out? When it's done. Yeah, that's a good time. When it's done. I get asked that question a lot, and I'm always very grateful to be asked it because it's nice that people are interested. It would be awful if no one was asking. Yes. However, I, I still don't have a definitive answer to it. There's a piece, there's a little thing I wrote that's on my website in which I just say, look, I'm working on it, and it'll be ready when it's ready. I don't really want to make a prediction, but it's coming. That's a good thing. Well, I can't wait for that one. Yeah, it's a huge uh, job. Oh, I bet. Do you know what year that will end yet, or...? It will be 66 sometime, okay. possibly, 66. probably the end of the year. So you're working on 66 stuff. I research across the span of years, but it will cover four years, 63, 64, 65, 66 only, but it will be massive. And what's amazing about your books for those who haven't read it, but they need to immediately is besides the music side and the Beatles side and the things we're talking about, you said everything in context of the time and the place and London and England and here. And How much credence do you give to the fact that America was in mourning from Kennedy and the Beatles were the new Camelot? Or what well, do you think about that? First of all, I wasn't here. So I have no personal experience on that. All I can do is listen to what other people say. I think it's one of those things where those who say America was in mourning and the Beatles brought freshness and vitality and a new lease of life, those who say it for themselves are speaking their truth. And those who say that's all been exaggerated, it really wasn't anything like that, they're speaking their truth. I don't know. There cannot be a definitive one answer to that. For some, it was true. For others, it wasn't true. It has to be the answer. Right. I think it was true for me. So that's then, all that matters. Then that is your truth. And that is absolutely valid. And there will be others who say it wasn't like that for me. And that is valid for them. I don't know why people need to impose a single view on the collective experience of hundreds of millions of people. Right. It can't be one. What I enjoy, too, is the film of them coming to America and them listening to Murray the K. Mm. And that, that is hilarious. Yeah. Do you know Murray the K? Or is he, I don't know, is he alive? No. He, no. Did you ever, do you, no. are you, is he in your work? 
Oh, I've researched Murray very deeply for, for Volume 2. I've got some great Murray the Case stuff for Volume 2. Okay, do you want to share any? First of all, when they came here, they thought they had the measure of the man. They had the measure of everybody, the Beatles. They had opinions on everybody. But they really, really did like him at the start because he was unlike anything they'd ever experienced in their life. They were used to British radio DJs, mostly, in fact, in British radio, they were called presenters. Um, they weren't really DJs like America had DJs. So Murray was the hippest guy or appeared to be the hippest guy. He spoke the lingo. He was razzmatazz. <laughs> yeah. And he was so, so infectiously New York radio, which to British ears was an alien beast. I mean, when the Beatles first came to America, they had the experience that all British people have when they first come here of, wow, <laughs> this place is not like home. Yes. And New York radio in those days epitomized that. And Murray epitomized New York radio. So they welcomed him in. Uh, they could see that he was taking advantage of them, but it suited them at that time. But the relationship shifted over periods of time. He, his relationship with Brian, which was always going to dictate his proximity to the Beatles, Murray's relationship with Brian blew hot and cold over the years. We know a fair bit about what Murray did with the Beatles. What people don't know is what Murray was asking for that wasn't granted, and I have a lot of that knowledge now. Uh, and he kind of um, asked for too many things in mm -hmm. their view over, as the years went by. And yet, still, when Brian came to New York in March 67 with The Who and The Cream, they were called The Cream then, not just Cream. Brian did a, an interview with Murray on his FM station. By the Murray had gone AM to FM by then and calmed down a bit. <laughs> and um, there was Brian with him, even though their relationship had been checkered by that point. So Murray still had his, his uses. And George wrote a forward for Murray's book that came out, I think, 66, 67. But they knew him. They understood him. No one ever pulled the wool over the Beatles' eyes. They had very <laughs> sharp opinions of people. As I understand it, too, when they went on Ed Sullivan, and the reason why I think this might be true is if you watch early Elvis or even uh, the Stones or the Crickets, the audio is horrible. And mm -hmm. I heard that they went and wanted to talk to the engineers. Most people think the Beatles were a brand new act when they hit the Ed Sullivan show, but mm -hmm. they were seasoned veterans. Yes. In Tune In, I number the years. Year 1958 is year one. That's when John, Paul and George are beginning to, you know, go for something. So 1964 is what, year seven? Oh. <laughs> right. And when they break up, it's year 13, I think it is. Yeah. Off the top of my head. I could write it down yeah, and work yeah. it out. But nonetheless, those figures sound about right. So then they were no beginners. I mean, again, everybody who made the grade before the Beatles, who had broken through, they'd pretty much broken through as beginners. Mm -hmm. Elvis was a pretty much a beginner, though obviously he was like from another planet, <laughs> the most sensational artist in his time. But in England, our version of Elvis was Cliff Richard. He was like discovered in that way that you see in films by some cigar chomping talent spotter, right? Mm -hmm. And he's on stage in a theater like within a week. And of course, he's a beginner. Well, when the Beatles land, as at number one in 63, 64, and so on, they've got more than a thousand shows under their belt. They've been doing this for years. They've done Hamburg. They've done all nighters in the cavern. They've done venues where, you know, everyone's going to risk being beaten up afterwards and fights. And they're running for their lives and they're driving all over the country. And they've done every TV show and every radio show. They were seasoned pros. They were no beginners. They appeared to arrive overnight, but it was that experience that they had of all those years of working when no one was really watching them that gave them the grounding to withstand everything that the 60s then threw at them. And they survived that most extraordinary decade, the 60s, in great shape, the Beatles. They remained remarkably normal and balanced with their feet on the ground, having gone through an experience that would have destroyed anybody else. We've talked about Ringo some, and now we'll go to George. So George was in Hamburg. He was pre-Hamburg. He was three years prior to Hamburg. Mm -hmm. He joined right after Paul. And if you listen to certainly the Decca audition, he has as many lead vocals as anyone. Yes. Yes. Hard Day's Night, he's got the big scene that I just love, Susan or whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then suddenly Lennon and McCartney go to a new level, and George is more or less left somewhat behind. Yes. And, of course, he does seem bitter in the anthology, seems to be sulking in, in his interviews following. Does. What's your take on the whole George thing? Well, George's view of the Beatles after the Beatles was, I mean, he blew hot and cold 
as they all have and have every right to do so, because it depends on what's in their mind at that particular moment. But George, George was absolutely 25% of the Beatles in every sense, but for the fact that really the Beatles' great fame turned on the fact that John and Paul wrote the most phenomenal catalogue of songs for them to do. And George wasn't part of that. And everything the Beatles earned money-wise as a group was split equally four ways. From the moment they bring Ringo in, he's on a complete 25% share, the same as the other three are. But John and Paul had their songwriting income, and therefore the Beatles had a great wealth disparity. John and Paul were much wealthier than George and Ringo. And George and Ringo kind of got marginalised in the studio. George Martin's main attention had to be on John and Paul because it was their songs. And George and Ringo would obviously contribute in many ways because they often added bits to those songs or added ideas, but they still stayed Lennon-McCartney. And George got squeezed. When Brian Epstein took over the Beatles management, he suggested to them that George has equal stage time at the microphone. And through 62, I set out and tune in the set lists that survive from that year. And whatever the order is, it's like George Paul John, George Paul John, George Paul John, George Paul John in terms of singing. But because Lennon and McCartney then wrote the hits and they come to Washington Coliseum and they're doing whatever 11, 12 numbers and they're pretty much the songs that people know from the records. That means they're Lennon and McCartney songs and therefore George is on the microphone much less. So it will be Paul saying now we'd like, you know, George would like to do a number or Ringo would like to do a number. But John and Paul have got the lion's share because they wrote the songs. Mm -hmm. And so that's how that shifted. But in every other sense, George was... I mean, the thing about the Beatles was anyone could bring an idea to the table and it would be listened to. And if it was the right idea, it would be picked up. And George was absolutely a part of that. I mean, going to India, for example, was George. George leading the way. Right. And that was a really good thing the Beatles did going to Rishikesh. Well, you have to go. And I am sorry to say those words, but thank you for coming. It's been remarkable, as good as I had hoped. Thank you very much. It really is a pleasure to be here on Hippie Radio.